Hey there, folks. Kiesel guitar artist Johnny Highland here, and you're watching Guitar Autopsy. Hey, welcome to another exciting episode of Guitar Autopsy. I'm your host, Rusty Cooley, and we've got uh, my great co-host, young Zach Atkins. Great co-host. Yes, the great hope. You've been elevated now. Great, great co-host. Cool. You do all the hard stuff. But, uh, That's true. But welcome to another exciting episode. We've got country guitar legend and virtuoso Johnny Highland on the show today. So um, stick around. Let's make it happen. So Johnny, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us, and uh, we really appreciate it. Um, how's things going for you? Man, I'm doing fantastic, Rusty, and I appreciate y'all having me on, brother. What a what a treat this is. Right on, man. So what you been doing to keep yourself busy these days? Well, you know, I've actually been pretty blessed, man. I actually uh, just went to uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, shot a couple more True Fire courses. Okay. And of course, I'm still teaching privately from home when I'm here. Do you have, I, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Do, you, do, you, do you have students that come to the house or is it all Skype or how's that work? I finally let a few folks come in, uh, you know, as long as they're social distancing with me and stuff, but, and you know, no bear hugs and stuff like that, but <laughs> right. But yeah, I finally let a few folks back in, but most of the time it's on Skype, so. Okay, that's cool. Do you do you do you have a good number of students, or you just take a few, or? You know, it varies, man. Month month to month. Uh, you know, I've had upwards to twenty in a month, and sometimes it can get lower than that. But the way I teach, man, it's like, look, I'm going to show you a lot of stuff in an hour and a half's time. Take your time to learn it, but don't come back to me till you're ready. Right, that's cool. So when you're teaching. Do you um, do you have the students record the lesson? Is that how they do it to, to keep up with all the information? Yeah, yeah, they record it. That's that's one of the cool features of Skype now is you can actually record as you go. So. Sure. When you're teaching, do you so you just you just play everything like fast and slow and then they got to just catch it by watching the video back or whatever. Or do you actually well, provide notation or, or tabs for the licks and examples? No, I don't do any tabs, but I tell you this man it's been pretty neat that students have been able to follow along with me i've i've been able to slow my playing down enough to where they can gra either grab it on the spot and then if they take too much time they'll go well man i'll just catch it on the rebound you know right very cool man and I those guys got a true fire you. i'm sorry zach go ahead i said i took lessons from him that's awesome man yeah yeah that the guys down at true fire are great right oh they are man they're man. they're absolutely the best in the world brother they're they're family to me i've I just finished up my fifth course uh, course with them and really? look, getting back, do some more. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, they've been wanting me to do my own channel over there um, and they got me set up and I just spent time, just not enough time in the day to do it. I heard that, brother. Really There's never enough. But uh, I did a product with them a few years back called Lickipedia. It was pretty cool. It was very fun um, and they're very professional and just super nice people. The nicest I people ever. I heard you know of that course. Yeah, you, you have yeah. or haven't? I have. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, I like that product a lot. Truefire has a great way of setting their their presentation up when you go to 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 watch it or if somebody buys it and they're gonna watch the product. I mean, it has a lot of great features like built-in metronome tuner. You can get the tabs, or you can get the guitar profiles, you can watch the video, you can watch any specific video. It's more user friendly than any product or company that I've been involved with in the past. Yeah, different different camera angles, yes. all time. And I, yeah, I'm pretty impressed too. I, I, I think I've only actually, uh, actually learned from one True Fire video, and it was, you know, and even going back and when you, you know, when they finish up yours, they go back and have you check things over and whatever, and it's, it's pretty interesting to do. Yeah, for sure, and and it's it's important to me to have that ability. I don't like, like it when you go in and do something and then you don't get to like give it your final okay before they put it out you know what i mean right i want i i you know man i want to go over everything and make sure that it's what i want it to be you know i don't want some you know just because you know sometimes you probably experienced this before but like you know have you ever gone into a recording studio and the guy that was recording you was so impressed for your playing that everything you do is great you know Absolutely. What I mean? 
Right. Yeah. So that's that's hard for you to do your best, isn't it? Well, and then on top of that, man, they love everything that you do. Right. And then when it comes out, you sound completely different than the original tone you gave them. Yeah. Yeah. So and, I so I it's it's hard to do when when you know the person's a fan or or just like oh man that was a great take and you're thinking to yourself no that was pretty crappy let me do it again no no that was good and it's like no man i'm gonna do that again you know because you know then you end up putting out a product that somebody else i mean you know the producer might have thought was great because he's a fan or something but it's not my best you know and i have to be careful of that you know what i mean so it's the same thing if you're doing something for an instructional company and you play something they're like oh no that was good and it's like no you know so by getting having the ability to check your work before it's released is you know in a roundabout is what I'm trying to say, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's well, it's, thing. that's, that's a very true statement, man. I think, uh, obviously you want the best for yourself and probably more hypercritical of your own work than anybody else. So for, for sure, yeah. you know, it's cause you know, in the end of the day, I know what I sound like, Yes. you know, yeah. and I know what needs work and I know what doesn't need work, you know? So, right. so that's pretty cool, man. So that's cool. How did you get into teaching? Man, I've been teaching for almost 30 years now. Okay. I've taught a lot. Man, that's, I've been teaching, God, let me see, I think I've been teaching a little longer than that. Uh, I don't know, do the math, I think I started teaching in 87. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's, it's been a few years, it's been a minute. Well, in 1987, I was 12. Okay, well, you might have been one of my students if I lived in the area. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. I wish yeah. I had that lessons from you back in the day, brother. Man, that would have been cool, man. So tell me about, you know, growing up, your influences and uh, whatnot, who, who you really were your favorites and who inspired you and, and how you got, you know, some, some of the diversity in your playing that, you know, you have things that most country players don't have. You know? Well, I think, I think everything started for me, Rusty, back when I was a real, real young kid. You know, I started playing bluegrass music, you know, when I was about four years old played bluegrass up until I was 15, but in the interim, I, I, my brother and sister saw that I was making money on the weekends and they were like, well, man, I want the new Nintendo or the new Sega Genesis or, so they ended up joining the, the three J's as what we were called. And, and we were a good family band, little novelty kid act for a long time. But then at the age of 10, I got to see Ricky Skaggs play the Bangor Auditorium in Bangor, Maine. And that changed my life. And I, after seeing Ricky, I was like, oh, my goodness, man, I, I, you know, the acoustic needs to go in the closet and I need an electric. Yeah. Was uh, was was Ray Flack playing guitar for him then? No, actually, he had just he had, he had just stopped working with Ricky then. Yeah. OK, he's a hell of but a picker. Ray later, you know, uh, what a beast, man. He's incredible. Oh, yeah. For real. Yeah. So, dude, you said Bang, Bangor, where? where? Where did you see him at? OK, so where are you from originally? I'm actually from a little town a hundred miles northeast of Bangor called Woodland, Maine, which is right up in the Palace area, St. Stephen, New Brunswick area. That is very much is about as far north as you can go, isn't it? Well, I mean, Aroostook County, you can go up further, but yes, as far as the eastern tip goes, yes. Yeah, boy, man, it's cold up there, bro. You're not kidding, brother. Yeah. So where are you living now? Well, actually, currently, my wife and I, uh, two years ago, moved to Chatham, Virginia. We we left now. Well, it kind of got a little too Lady Gaga for me. Yeah, I hear you. you no know, country music got a little bit too pop and a little too, uh, I don't know. It just the traditional side of it kind of went away. Well, I, I know exactly what you mean. Because to me, when I see country music videos, it looks like they, they dress kind of like 80s rockers. Yeah. With the jeans and the boots and the tight pants and the fringe and stuff. You know, choreographed kicking, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't fit any of that mold, brother. So that yeah. kind of, if the cowboy hat and the boots are gone, man, then so's Johnny. You know. That's right. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very much a traditionalist in that sense too. When it comes to country music, you know, I was, I was raised around it all my life. My parents and you know all their friends and stuff. And so you don't, do you own any tellies, Rusty? I do. Do you? It's not actually a Fender telly, but it is a, uh, it's, it's a Tracy Guns model, and I know that's not very country. But uh, it's his signature model that I got when I used when I was had my last endorsement deal. Um, so it's uh, it's not a traditional telly, but it's it's very much a telly. Um, it's uh, it's got it's got two humbuckers, so it's not traditional in that sense. But it does have coil taps, so I can get the nice twang and stuff. There so you go. It's pretty cool. I've always been a huge telly fan. Um, always. 
Cool. Uh, for as long as I remember. Um, I love the way they sound clean and I love that spank you get with it. And I love the, uh, I love the way they sound with high gain as well. It's very cool and unique sound. Yeah, it really is, man. I, you know, speaking of being a traditionalist, man, I, you know, uh, joined up with Kiesel guitars back in 2016. And when we did my Johnny Highland model, man, I've been more impressed with this little guitar than I've ever been any guitar I've ever owned. Uh, and the reason being is it's very much traditional feeling to any uh, Telecaster player out there, man. They'd fall in love with a Johnny model pretty quickly. That's cool, man. I'd love to get my hands on one. So tell yeah. us about it. What, what makes it so special? Uh, what, what are well, your, do you have some specific features that you had them do on it? Yeah, man, I'll, I'll show you a few. I've got one of them in my hands now. It's a, this was actually one that uh, Jeff Kiesel made me for my 45th birthday. And uh, this is actually a silver sparkle. Very nice. I dig it. And it's uh, kind of Don Rich inspired, you know. But what we did with this guitar, man, is we got three Strat size pickups. And of course, I have steak fries for fingers, man. So I could never, I could never reach the volume and tone knob on a standard telly worth a dang, man. So, right. so we moved the, the knobs and the switch to where they're easily accessible. And kind of did the strat arm contour and the belly cut, of course. Okay, yeah. <laughs> right on. But, uh, but what's so cool about this guitar, though, man, is we did a five-way, Dunlop five-way super switch. And so one, three, and five uh, on the switch are your standard telly style. Second position is the second position strat tone, like the Albert Lee thing and Steve Warner, guys like that. But then the fourth position is just the middle pickup by itself. And that, so if I'm in Stevie, Stevie Ray world, I can do the rip stuff with the middle strap pickup and then hit the neck pickup and do my leads and that kind of thing. But yeah, real traditional feeling guitar. And, uh, you know, of course, maple neck, but we did the big black diamond inlays for the blind guy to see. And, uh, you know, but stainless steel frets now, lock and tuners, makes it a little more modern feeling than your standard telly. But, but I'm so proud of this guitar, man. And it's been a, you know, but, you know, I've been with Kiesel since 2016, and here recently I just teamed up with Mike Pascal out in San Francisco, and we've just designed the new Johnny Highland amp with Fat Jimmy amps. Oh, wow. And Killer, man, man. 112, 85 watt, all tube, uh, butt kicker is what it is, man. Dude, I want one of those. <laughs> and I'll tell you, he's a beast, man. So the happy marriage between guitar and amplifier, man, it's, it's real. Oh yeah, for sure. So let me ask you this. What do you, do you, uh, you mentioned stainless steel frets. Is that something that you wanted to try or was recommended to you or? It's all offered, uh, in a standard way. And I was just like, well, man, I've, you know, I've never really played them. And I had heard that they give you a really bright tone. Uh, but to be, to be honest, man, I never really found them to be, uh, you know, too aggressive in the high end. I thought they were quite nice. And as hard as I've been doing all my steel guitar bends and stuff, man, it's, you know, they're tough as nails. So I, I just loved it. That's cool, man. Because I, I had heard the same thing. My new signature model uh, with Ormsby comes with stainless steel frets as well. And yep. I had never played them before. And I thought, well, okay, well, let's give it a shot. It's, you know, I'm, I'm into the fact that I don't have to get a fret job ever again. You know, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a cool feature for sure, man. So have you, uh, have you found Rusty that they change your tone? I haven't really heard that either. Um, not so much. No, I'm not really sure where that came from. Maybe it was, I don't know. There's always somebody bad apple in a bunch trying to give something a bad name because they don't want to try it. Right. Yeah, sure. Right. But I, I, so far I don't Zach, what about you, bud? Um, I haven't noticed a difference at all. Mm -mm. No, I mean, I've done, the only thing I've noticed is they, they're harder. Like yeah. they don't ding and stuff like that, you know, like right. you, can, you kind of rough them up a little bit, but no, I don't think that, uh, I don't, I don't know. I think people that say that are delusional. Yeah. And I, I mean, and that's the whole reason that people use stainless steel frets is because they don't wear out. You don't get to right. in them and stuff like that. You know what I mean? They definitely stay shiny, you know, yeah. like they stay shiny longer. Yeah. Which is great. Cause I guess that's part of the stainless steel concept, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, I haven't owned a guitar with stainless steel frets long enough to to see that kind of wear yet. But 
I don't, I don't have anywhere at all in any of them. Well, I can assure both of you guys, I've had my Kiesels for, oh, goodness, about five years now, and I've been playing the guts out of them. I have never had a Kiesel in the shop outside of Joe Glazer checking the first couple over in Nashville, making sure everything was good, and, and you know, of course, wanting to stick it on a Plex machine because Kiesel doesn't do Plex jobs, you know. Gotcha. But I'll be honest, man, as far as the, uh, the frets go, I haven't wore them down in five years, man, so... And I bend a lot, so. Yeah. So tell me about that. You said, what is it called? Placking? Uh, placking, like a, a pleck machine. Right. I've heard about that before. Can you explain what that does? Well, it's actually a, I really don't know much about it, except for the fact that they, they hang your guitar in this machine, and it, it somehow in the computer takes a scan of your fretboard to find out if your neck is perfectly straight or the actual action that you use that you'll never have any fret buzz all the way up the fretboard, your action wow. and everything will be just your fret size and everything will be just absolutely perfect. That's pretty sick, man. It, and I was it, looking to buy one. What? Yeah, they're uh, they're hugely expensive, I'm sure, but It's about 100 grand. Oh, gee, yeah. you going to buy one? Yeah. Five. For what? Well, because there's only so many in the United States that that there's only so many companies that offer it and a lot of them are you know, 30 plus weeks out because the people that want to get it done, they just have that much work to do. So, yeah. I mean, if I spent a hundred grand and bought one, which I could do, then like, <laughs> I mean, I could, we could, we could do it. It's yeah. <laughs> because I'd pay it. I'd get it paid back really quickly because people really want this new technology, you know? And, uh, so I've been talking to my guitar tech about it, you know, Steve, and then, uh, so how new is it? How new is what? The, the, the tech, yeah. Uh, I I don't really know much about that. Steve was looking more into it, but because I just recently heard about it within the last year or two. Yeah, I'd never I heard mean, about it. I know that Sweetwater offers it. Um, that's it's where expensive I heard about it. too. I mean, yeah. is it? From what I understand, guys, it's been around probably the last at least five or six years. Okay, so it's that new. Yeah, and and uh, I know like to get one done at Joe Blazer's shop in Nashville is like 126 bucks, something like that. Oh, that's not too bad. Yeah. And it's, but I got to say though, I, you know, Kiesel does not fret, uh, pleck their, their frets. Right. But I got to say, there's something that I've grown to find depending on the guitar. It can sometimes make your guitar feel too stiff. Really? I mean, too perfect. Man, I, I've been uh, getting Kiesel guitars straight from the factory and just finding that I really love how they feel. Yeah. Therefore, I'm not going to mess with it at all. So. Sure, sure. That makes sense. It's not broken. Don't fix it, right? Right. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, I'm a big believer in that as well, too. It's interesting, though, um, you know, speaking about feeling too per perfect or stiff or whatever, that, that reminds me of uh, some conversations I've had with the other guitar players that use that true temperament fretboard. Mm. Are you familiar with that? I'm not. Well, it's, it's the, the guitar necks that they, they install these, like, squiggly frets. Oh. You know what I'm talking about? Have yeah, yeah. So that's supposed to put your guitar in perfect tune. You know how there's always this weird little bit of discrepancy between the B and G string. Yeah. You know, on major thirds, perfect fourths, and stuff like that. It's it's supposed to eliminate all of that, and it's supposed to truly intonate your guitar perfectly. Wow. So the interesting thing is that I that I've heard about it is that when say one guitar player is playing this guitar and this tuning, and then they play with another guitar player in their band that doesn't have it. Um, or the bass player doesn't have it, then everything's yeah. nothing's ever in tune. Didn't you tell me something about that too, Zach? Yeah, my my friend uh, Fred, he has a true temperament, and then he's just in like a cover band. You know, they just play like you know, like fifty songs and just like whatever. And he was playing his true temperament, and it's nowhere near in tune with the other guitar player. You know, when you're playing the same note, it, it, you can hear those that little off between the notes i guess and so if you if you both don't have it you're not going to really sound that great together you know that's, yeah. that's interesting you know to think about it like that you know i heard it's like it almost makes things so perfect that it sounds weird to your ear because mm -hmm. you're not used to hearing it that way right well the guitar is an imperfect instrument on its well, own of course so it's like we're used to that i think part of the job of being a great guitar player is keeping your guitar in tune the best you can while you're playing it Yes, that's okay. true, man. Right, making an out of tune, imperfect instrument in tune. Right. You know what I mean? That's that's pretty wild, man. 
Right. So um, you want to tell us, you, you know, you mentioned your signature amp. How did that come about? Well, actually, man, that's not even on the market yet. It's brand new. I just actually got the prototype before I went to Atlanta this past weekend. I had to do a, a clinic with Red Vocart and Brent Mason. And, oh, uh, nice. I guess Brent's dad ended up having a bad stroke, though, so Brent wasn't able to make it. Gotcha. That's too bad. That's a bummer, yeah. Red Vocart and I had a blast, though. We really had a good time. So I assume you know Brent Mason already, right? Oh, I've known Brent as a friend for over 20 years now. Yeah, yeah. he's a great guitar player, man. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. love his stuff. Very yeah. Cool, man. So um, what else you got going on these days? I know you're, you're, you're super busy with gigging because it was, it was an interesting a little bit of a challenge to pin you down to a date for the show. Um, yeah. That's a good thing because you're busy. I mean, busy is good when you're playing guitar. You know, Rusty, I've been blessed, man, in the respect that when this COVID stuff hit, man, like anybody else, we were all shut down, you know. But I swear, man, since this year started, I've been slamming, man. It's been a crazy year for me. I, I, uh, you know, I went and did the uh, the True Fire stuff. I was home for about ten days, then I went to to uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and played the Birchmere for the Danny Gatton birthday bash. Cool. And which Danny Gatton is my biggest guitar hero, by the way. I know you. Yeah, right. Early. Okay. And. Uh, so I got to do that show and then got back home for 10 more days working in the studio on people's stuff and then went to Atlanta with, with Red and did that. And now uh, a week a week after this Sunday, I'll be heading to Nashville working with Band in a Box, doing some stuff for them and then home for a while and then off to Gatlinburg. And so, yeah, it's been a great year, man, but I've, I've been actually touring more than I ever thought I would. Wow, that's and you are busy, man. That's, that's yeah, great, it's dude. Yeah, it's wild because I'm not really doing anything with my band per se. It's just solo Johnny stuff, you know. It's been pretty crazy. So, so what does that entail, solo Johnny stuff? What does that mean? Well, does that mean you're by yourself with backing tracks, or is that with a band? Or no, it's actually with a band, but it's it's really uh, you know, like doing the clinic with Red. We had a little jam with the students and stuff at the end, and. Like the Danny Gatton show, there was all of Danny's old cronies that played with him over the years, and they put together this gigantic, you know, gigantic band. And so it's just been a lot of stuff without my own boys, man. And it's it's been weird, but it's been fun, though. Yeah, for sure, man. What's the band yeah. in the box about? That kind of thing, man. They, You know, it's interesting. People can get Johnny Highland on a record without actually calling me and asking me to play live on it. So Really? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a pretty interesting thing, Rusty. I got to admit, man, you can actually buy the package and like craft your song, drums, bass, rhythm guitar, whatever, steel guitar, piano. And then when you want a guitar solo, you can go into Brent Mason, myself, all kinds of guitar players. Wow. And pick a solo in whatever key you want and see if it fits what you want. Or you can go through a whole list of things and find another one. And, and you can That's solve a crazy concept. Yeah, yeah, is, yeah, that's not in, in, involved with True Fire in any way, is it? No. No, it's completely different. True Fire has something like that called In Session, though, don't they? Something like that. Yeah, I have not done one yet, but I'd love but I don't, to. But I don't think the In Session thing you can actually, I think you can jam with it, but not right. like manipulate it like you're talking about. Right, you can't actually re like record your own song. See, Bandbox, you can take a song that you write, and literally craft the band around your song. So like you can, you can actually send in a, like, I guess through your computer, you can log in, put in a chord chart and band in a box will somehow complete your song with bass, drums and rhythm guitar to your chart. And then you can put all the other instruments in around it, man. It's just crazy. That's super cool, man. That yeah. Really it's cool. neat. Now I, I must say I'm, tickled to death to be a part of that and to be doing that but i don't really know the first thing about how to use it although i have had buddies send me songs they finished and go hey man check out my new song and it's me playing the solo and i'm going <laughs> record yeah he's like no your band in a box did though yeah that's that's, that's pretty funny because you you recognize and go wait a minute <laughs> how'd you yeah. get my solo on there oh and so it's like i think they piece licks together and mm -hmm. kind of stuff like that so it's neat so you can take a solo that you recorded for Band in the Box, and they can actually extract one lick from a different solo. And you know, could they extract like? Could they take like a solo that Brent Mason did and you did, maybe another guy, and cut licks from each of you guys' solos and put it together to make one solo? 
Now that I don't know because tonally, I guess we're all kind of different, but not saying that that's not possible because they do, they do put a little box on your guitar that basically runs the, the direct signal through as you're recording. Right. So, so they get a DI of it, right? Yes. So they could yeah. potentially do that. I would assume that'd be cool, man. That'd be neat. I, could, I could take and splice Eddie Van Halen and Ingve and, you know, I don't know. You. Right. Somebody else put it all together in one solo. That'd be cool, man. That would be bad to the bone, man. Yeah. That'd be fun. That's, that's an interesting technology. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, it seems yeah. pretty sweet. So let's talk a little bit about all your guitar influences. I know you started, we started talking about that and got sidetracked a little bit, but um, you mentioned Ricky Skaggs is what you got, got you really uh, amped up. What, what, who follows after that? Well, I think through actually loving, you know, my love for Ricky Skaggs, I learned about Albert Lee, learned about Brent Mason. And of course, you know, I was a country music lover, man. So I was watching TNN at the time and, you know, the national network on TV a lot. And of course, Austin City Limits. So I guess the weird thing for me, Rusty, is I loved all the early, you know, all the country guys, you know, Brent and Albert Lee and, yeah. and of course, Ricky Skaggs, Steve Warner, Vince Gill, guys like that. Yeah. But then at the same time, man, I was into like Stevie Ray Vaughan, Eric Johnson, yeah, uh, Eddie Van Halen, of course, you know, sure. I, I was a child of the 80s, man. So I, you know, loved Van Halen. And but then later on as a teenager, after I got my first electric when I was 12 and but I'd already played bluegrass. So I just kind of morphed over to the electric. And but, you know, remember getting my first walk pedal, stuff like that, learning about Hendrix and guys like that. So. It was, uh, and here's actually a funny story for you guys. So my dad took me to Northern Kingdom Music in Bangor, Maine. And of course, there were a lot of amazing players in Maine too. Lenny Bro come from Maine and his brother Denny is still up there, you know, and of course, uh, but there was a lot of amazing guitar players around the area like Bill Pierce, Gary Rand, uh, Mark Miller, guys like that that I saw through the Downey's Country Music Association as I was doing stuff with my brother and sister. And so I was meeting all these amazing electric guitar players, but I wasn't playing much myself. So it kind of, you know, even the local guys really inspired me to, to want to pick up the electric. But so dad took me to Northern Kingdom Music, man, took me a half a day out of junior high school, drove me two hours to Northern Kingdom Music. And of course, I wanted a telly because that's what Ricky was playing. Little did I know it was a Joe Glazier telly, but yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we got there. This was 1987. And, uh, and it was so funny, man, because they had no American made tellies in stock. And my dad refused to buy a Japanese made guitar or whatever. He at right. the time was like, no, I'm not, you know, it's going to be USA made or I'm not going to buy it. And, you know, God love my dad wanting to buy American. Right. Yeah, so, right. Absolutely. So uh, anyway, the, all they had was Ameri a couple of American strats. And of course, I'm looking at my dad going, I don't, that's not where Ricky played. I don't, that's not what I want. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, dad actually called the owner of the store out named Dana Flood. And he, uh, dad said, look, there's two strats on the wall, a red one and an ugly charcoal gray one. <laughs> dad said, play them both and pick the kid out the right one. You know, the one that's the better of the two guitars. So, of course, Johnny wanted the red one, and I ended up with the charcoal gray one. <laughs> so, <laughs> the whole time, Rusty, what makes me laugh about this story, brother, is I still have that strat to this day. Oh, that's awesome, man. And I remember Dana Flood handing my dad a uh, guitar player magazine that was called Strat Magic. Because it showed you basically how to set intonation, how to check your action. We live two hours away from our local music store, so... right. Dad was like, well, I'm going to learn how to do all that stuff for you. So your guitars always stay in tune and they play good. Well, come to find out, man. I So I was all bummed out about this ugly charcoal gray strat. <laughs> and Dana handed me that magazine and he opened it up. And of course, there's a picture of Eric Clapton with a gray one. Yeah. A silver oh. gray. Nice. And so I was like, oh, cool. Okay. A strat yeah. of work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, and of course, later I had played so many gigs, you know, in country bands at the time that, you know, by 15 or 16, I had a couple of tallies by then that I bought off, you know, out of the Uncle Henry magazine, you know, secondhand, but, you know. Sure. That's awesome. But, uh, yeah, my That's first cool, electric man. was a Strat, not a telly. Nice. 
Yeah. So, so um, did, once once you got that thing home, did you actually enjoy it? Yeah. And now here's another crazy story, guys. So we got our home, and my dad lets me play it for a few hours, and I get up the next morning, and uh, I didn't see my strat. I was like, "Oh my goodness, what's going on?" My dad had the strat out in the woodshed and tore the whole guitar apart. Oh no! And oh, I was like. Oh, and here's my dad, you know, a pipe fitter, welder for Georgia Pacific Paper Mill. So I'm like, yeah, I don't know, dad. You're not a guitar tech, you know. But come to find out, man, when dad put that guitar back together, it played better than when it come off the wall. So he had been doing his homework. Well, he read that Strat Magic magazine, you know, the Guitar Player magazine. God, you know, God love him for doing that, you know. Yeah, that was but, that that was in eighty seven, that issue? Yep. I probably had that issue. Oh, no doubt, man. I think that thing got passed around, man. It was like the the Bible for Stratocasters. Do you, you know? do, what was do you remember what was on the cover? Yeah, it was a angled red strat. Which was hilarious because it reminded me of the strat that I wanted. That you wanted, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's why I remember it to this day. Yeah, it's funny how those things turn out, man. Yeah. I had a uh, guitar that me and my dad had made uh, when I was in high school. It was made out of Wormuth parts. And, um, you know, me and my dad built it together and he painted it and um, whatnot. And we put it together. I mean, you know, it, it, we didn't go outside and cut a tree down and carve it or nothing. Right. Like that. We had bought parts and stuff. And, but, uh, you know, I don't know. Shortly after I got out of high school, I ended up selling it to one of my students because I got my first Super Strat. And, um, you know, I, it was gone. Many, many years later, I think it was around 2010 uh, or nine, I get an email from this kid who's not a grown man. He's got his own wife and kids and stuff like that. And he's like, hey, I just want to see if you're still playing guitar. I'm the guy that bought that guitar from you. Uh, wow. Then. Yeah. So after all those years, I probably sold it in 88, 89, maybe 90, somewhere around there. And I got it back finally. You know, I thought I, I figured I would run into it in a pawn shop or something somewhere through the years. Right. And I finally got the call from or the email from the kid saying, hey, he goes, he goes, I was going to get rid of it, but I wanted to see if you wanted it back first. And I was like, yeah, absolutely, man. And I said, what do you want for? And he goes, I'll sell it back to you for what you sold it to me for 350 bucks. I said, all right, done. You know, because at that point, my dad had already passed and uh, yeah. it was really special to get it back. You know, so that's so pretty cool. rare for that sort of thing to happen. You know what I mean? Uh, and the guitar was in great shape, dude. It's in the exact same shape I, I sold it in. Still had the same stickers on it that I had on it and stuff. You wow. know? Yeah, it looks great, man. What was so, what was the name of the magazine? Guitar Player. It was Strat Mania, right? I think it was. It uh, could have been Strat Mania or Strat Mad. I almost it, think it was Strat Mad. But it had a red Strat on the front, right, with David Bowie on the top. Cause it's got like a little photo. Of, I got a photo of it and it's the only one I can find that, that is kind of close to what you're talking about. Can you show me the cover? Yeah. I'm going to send it here real quick. Yeah. I want to see it. Cause I probably had that. Cause I used to have, cause it's got a red strat and it looks like ma magic because it's in cursive, but it actually says mania. Mania. No kidding. There you go. Well, At least been... if this is the one, I think I just sent it to everyone. Okay. Yeah. I see it's down here in the chat. Let me see. It's been so many years ago, Zach. I don't remember brother. Yeah, well, it, it might bring up memories for you. Well, I this got like wiring the super strat oh, yeah. history, real yep. story, fine yep. tuners. I had this yep. issue. I had this one. Yeah, it looks sick. Yep, I remember that. My first guitar was a. Uh, wow, it was only two ninety five then. Yeah. <laughs> ah, cheap. August eighty seven, dude. Yep, I was grad. I just graduated high school that year. Wow. My first guitar was a Fender Squire Strat, yeah. white, white with white, and uh, it was really funny because it was on my 12th birthday. It was in between my, my brother and I's birthday because he's in January, I'm in March, and so it was like mid-February, and my dad bought my brother an electric drum kit, and he comes downstairs with it because it was after Derek's birthday, and he told him he was getting him a drum set, so he comes down, and he's got all this drum stuff set up. We come home from school, and... Derek's like freaking out and super excited about it and jumps on and starts banging away at it. And I'm just pissed, dude. I'm like in the corner, just pissed off. Cause I didn't get anything, you know? And my dad's like, he's like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, well, I thought I was going to get something too. And he's like, it's not your birthday yet. And I was like, 
yeah, but still, like, Derek gets to play, and I don't get to do anything. So I'm just going to sit here. Like, I was so <laughs> mad. And then he, like, he just let me pout for, like, a half hour. And then he comes downstairs, and he had bought me the Fender Squire Strat with an amp and all the stuff. And he's like, I was just, I was just fucking with you. And I was like, oh, great, thanks. <laughs> Zach, do you, do you remember what the amp was, brother? No, it was, it was just a shitty little Fender amp that you get with the – it was like a, one of those guitar gig pack type things, you know, where it comes with all the stuff. My dad already had like 30 guitars, but he didn't want me touching them. Yeah. Well, man, I remember my, my uh, Dana Flood was, you know, talking to my dad when, when we picked out the gray Strat, or Dana had told dad that was the best Strat in there. And the funny thing was, uh, I found out at the time that I could not see Rosewood fingerboards. Oh. Because um, there was a black one there, too, with a black guard that I thought was pretty cool. But it just... I couldn't see to play the Rosewood fretboard. So I've always been a maple neck guy ever since. But right. funny thing is, uh, dad bought me a, a PV uh, classic chorus 130 and a wah pedal. Nice. At the same time. So that was actually my gigging rig as I started in country bands when I was 12. There you go, man. My first, uh, my first rig was uh, a PV T27 amp and a PV Decade amplifier. Oh, man. Yeah, man. I don't know if you remember those old PVs. They came with those big plastic cases, you know, yep. um, and the little Decade amp. Oh, my gracious. Sounded I remember. awful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there was, it was like two sounds, shit and shittier. <laughs> 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 you know? Hey, I'll, I'll be right back. Sorry, guys. Yeah, man. No worries. Keep talking. But uh, You know, Rusty, the funny thing is, too, brother, after you – know, my dad was very much uh, a man who wanted me to learn every instrument in the high school band uh, and really thought that I would become a music teacher, uh, like for a high school or a grade school or whatever, and then teach school during the year and then play in a band during the summers. And so I graduated uh, first honor essay in my class and then went on three years at the University of Southern Maine. Uh, as a history major, but a minor in elementary ed. And the crazy thing is, man, is after, you know, he, he said, you man, you got to wait till you're 21 before you can make up your own mind as to what you're doing. And as much as I had played throughout my life, uh, I just can't believe it was a big shock to my mom and dad when I left college after the third year and said, I'm moving to Nashville. <laughs> now, I think the freaky part is, man, is that they – they were just scared of a, you know, for a legally blind guy to just go off on his own down to a big old city. Right. Raised in a little tiny town, you know, and so they were, but you know, dad was pretty rough on me, man. He said, if you, if you're making this decision and you're going, don't you call me for anything. Yeah. And so yeah. I moved to Nashville with 96 bucks in my pocket, man, in Holy. 1996. Holy cow, dude. And, uh, but I'll be honest, man, my buddy Sid, who I played music with, Sid MacArthur, I played music with him all the way from the time I was 12 to, to you know, basically 21. And uh, he called me and said, man, I live in Orlando now, dude. And uh, he said, you know, I just got back from Nashville, man. We, we do great down there, man. Why don't you fly to Orlando, meet up with me, and we'll drive to Nashville together. And so it was like God answered a prayer, man, because I had someone who already knew my disability. Yeah. And it worked with me for years, actually helped, you know, assist me and get settled in, you know. And uh, that's pretty cool. It was man. amazing, though, man. I know it was weird because within the first, well, I had a gig the second day I was in Nashville, man. And the next thing I knew, seven years straight, I was playing about three shifts a day on Lower Broadway in Nashville. So, man, you pretty much got there and went right to work. I did. Was that, did. Through, your, was that through your connection with your buddy? Yeah, you know, scared shitless, man. But we just went to the clubs and asked if we could sit in, you know, with any band we could see, you know. And uh, so by the next day, I had a gig, yeah, from three to eight in the afternoon. Wow. And, uh, it was a Sunday afternoon, and then Funny thing is, though, is the old Telecaster I had bought when I was 16 in Maine. After so long, man, that I took it over to Joe and I said, man, it's weird. The neck feels like it's moving or something. And Joe's like, yeah, man, you kind of stripped all four bolts to hold the neck on, man. They're all, the holes are all stripped out. And he's like, man, your string ferrules are all, 
you know, gouged out and stuff. He's like, dude, this telly is toast, man. It's done. <laughs> oh man. And they, when I bought it from the guy when I was 16, man, he had cut the, cut the bridge plate and put a humbucker in the bridge. And so, but he decided to put an original telly bridge pickup back in. So he put a black plastic plate on it so that he could mount the original pickup back in. So the guitar was a Franken telly to begin with, even though it was an American made Fender. And it had a rosewood fingerboard that I'd have to fight to see on stage, you know, but it was in my price range at that time. And, but it made me through a couple of years in Nashville. And then Joe was like, son, I think you just need another telly and put this one in the scrap heap. So, uh, but it's just so amazing, man, how we go through guitars in our career and people don't realize, you know, for me, man, I moved to Nashville, like I said, with 96 bucks in my pocket. And the only way I was able to make my career happen was to, to garner all the endorsements I've had through the years, you know? So I give thanks to Kiesel Guitars and Fat Jimmy Amps and DestroyAllGuitars.com and all the people, you know, Elixir Strings and Celestian Speakers, all the guys that have helped me all these years, because I would not be Johnny Highland, the artist I am today, without each and every one of them. Yeah, that's awesome, man, for sure. So let me ask you this. You know, you were talking about you were going, you got three years into college. Yep. As a history major and a music education minor? Uh, just elementary education. Oh, elementary. Okay, so, so three years in, this is when you get the call and you go to Florida and then drive to Nashville. Well, that's when I basically told my parents, bye, I'm going. Yeah. yeah. So, and but yet, I, that, that means that this whole time you were in college, you were staying on top of your chops. Oh, brother, trust me. It was a, in the 24 hour day, man, I was playing guitar about 14 hours a day, studying about four and then sleeping the rest. Yeah. That sounds about like me when I was in college. Um, <laughs> that I sounds like a good day. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't finish college either. I had a, I had a full scholarship to go to school anywhere in Texas that I wanted to go to, and I didn't want to go at all because I wanted to go to GIT. But the scholarship was only in Texas. My parents didn't have the money, so my counselor convinced me to to at least try it. Okay, now there was restrictions with the, the uh, scholarship that I had to take twelve hours, right? So that was a lot for me because I didn't want to go anyway. So I right. that was taken twelve hours of college. Uh, a semester and I was teaching at two guitar shops. I was working at a record store two days a week and rehearsing with my band five nights a week. Right. So after, a, you know, a year or so of that, I was just like burnt out. I had to make a decision, you know, what do I really want to do with my life? Yeah. And at that point it was like, well, I want to play guitar. So I dropped school. I can sell it all of my, all of my students to one guitar shop, dropped the record store. And that was it. And at that point, that's when I started playing, you know, around 14, 16 hours a day too. Because I mean, you get up in the morning, I'd play guitar in the afternoon, I'd go in and teach in the evening. I would go to rehearsal, you know, so my guitar was in my hands from all the time sun, to sundown and well after sundown many times, you know, and that's, yeah. it's in those moments that we really, um, develop a lot, you know, I mean, there's, there's so much to be said for just constantly having your guitar in your hands. You know what I mean? You know, Rusty, I guess I was one of those kids, man, that, would spend all of my money I had on, on CDs. I learned to play basically from listening to records. And it was to the point where I could, like for an example, I could pop on uh, Flying in a Blue Dream, you know, Satriani and, and like match his tone, had an Ibanez. And, you know, as, even as a youngster, you know, or a late teen, I knew that I wanted to be a session player. So I had bought a Les Paul, I had an Ibanez with a Floyd on and I had a, you know, a Tele and I had a couple of Strats and I, you know, so I thought, man, I've got all the guitars I need to be a good, you know, to be a session guy. And, and so to me, it was like, can I match Van Halen's tone? Can I match Joe Satriani's tone? Can I match, and you know, play the licks properly. Can I, yeah. can I play all these different styles? And you know, really loved it. By that time, I was into Frank and Bali, and I was into nice dude. You know, uh, Alan Holsworth stuff, and yep. and uh, Vinnie Moore. Really loved Vinnie a lot. And we grew up listening to the same stuff, man. Yeah, man. But still, to me though, it was like, God, man, I'd listen to a Satriani record, and then I'd listen to a Van Halen record, and then I'd have to pop on Ray Price. You know, right. So how do yeah. how do you how do you manage all that? I mean, especially if you're trying to match the tone too, not just learn the notes. You're trying to match the tone. See, for me, it's I've never tried to really match the tone. I've always had my sound, but I want to 
you know, I want to nail the licks or or something like that. You know what I mean? Well, it, it get the it's more vibe. Licks too, but as a session musician, I was like, right. how are they getting this tone? Yeah. I wanted to know how they were getting it. So I started reading a lot about, you know, Hendrix pulling tubes half out and, you know, Interesting. Or what it was when someone busted a speaker, like a blew a speaker in the session and accidental, you know, uh, accidental things that caused records to be cool because, you know, a speaker blew or something like that. So, and of course I learned about fuzz pedals and wah pedals and different things that people used. And, but you're right though. I don't think I actually found my identity uh, until moving to Nashville and realizing what a tube amp was and, and right. what it was to dab, because man, I was into rat gear, I was into all that yep. stuff. Yep, that's and that's like, par for the course during that generation. Yeah, and then when I moved to Nashville, and I saw guys like Red Vocart or Pete Mitchell or you know guys like that that were actual Nashville road dogs, man, and and you know uh, icon players, you know, I mean Pete Mitchell played for Ernest Tubb and the Texas Troubadours, for God's nice, sake. Man. You know, he, oh, yeah. So when I go to Nashville and I see him like an offender baseman <laughs> with three boss pedals bolted to the bottom. Wow. He could just plug in a cable and run this, run the yeah. power and go play the gig, you know? Yeah. He had the pedals bolted to the amp. Yeah. And I was like, well, wait a minute, man. This, this is kind of cool. I mean, you go from sacking all this shit to a gig, man, and find out that the best players in the world are using an amp, three pedals, and a guitar. Right. Right. Yeah. That was awesome for me. That was the yeah. life for me. And then I realized to find my own identity, I essentially have started over several times to find the Johnny Highland tone. Like, you know, it's like people say, you know, well, Eddie Van Halen's tone changed when he went from the old Marshalls to the 5150s. Yeah. And then he changed from you know, the old Kramer, the, uh, you know, music man, and then went to PV and, it, you know, so it's kind of the same way with me. It was like, I, as I was swapping gear in my career, it was like, sometimes I had to allow my, make my pedal board, uh, to where it was assisting my tone. To me nowadays with the fat Jimmy amp and the Johnny Highland model Kiesel, now I'm back to actually building a pedal board that is specifically ear candy. Yes, right. So where the main tone is coming from your amp and your guitar. Exactly. Your, your pedals are just reverb and a little slap delay, maybe, you know. Yeah. Maybe compression, stuff like that. So Yeah. In other words, you're not getting your tone from your pedals. You're getting it from your guitar right. and your amp. And that's but the I mean, way it's... My rig rundown with Premier Guitar, man, I had a 42-inch pedal board, for God's sake. It was yeah. huge. Yeah. I mean, so, that's... I believe that's the way you really have to do it. You have to start with the foundation. If you don't have a good foundation, then you have everything else is a Band-Aid on the wound, you know? Well, you know, Rusty, I'm just going to put it out there, man, because I know there's a lot of people watching this. And frankly, man, I'm so, you know, it bothers me when people call Johnny Highland a gear whore. Yeah. And I'm like, mm. well, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. Okay, yes, I have gone from, you know, two or three different guitar companies a lot of the amp companies I were with either went out of business or they just couldn't, you know, couldn't do it. Right. And so frankly, man, I think as you change gear as an endorser, you realize it's just as much about the people as it is the gear. Oh, absolutely. I will agree with that 110%, man. It's but then again, I also want to attribute that as well to me being on my own tonal journey through this yeah. whole time. I mean, yeah. As a 46-year-old man, I can honestly tell you, I have finally found my Johnny tone, the tone that makes me addicted to want to play every day of my life. That's awesome, man. So it's taken me this long, though, to find that identity to where I go, yeah, that's this is exactly the rig I've always wanted. And yet, some in some cases, I feel like I've gone backwards because I had the huge rigs, the two half stacks, the 42-inch board. And now I'm back to a 112, you know, all tube combo amp with a with a T style guitar from Kiesel and a few pedals on the floor. That's it. Yeah, man. I uh, I've I've done similar stuff like that in my career. I mean, I played an old Fender M M80 amplifier uh, through a Fender cabinet with a yep. tube screamer and a wah pedal and maybe a Phase 90 or a, and a delay or something here and there. And I played that forever. I played that on my. I played that almost exclusively on my instrumental album, but by then I think I was using a tube power amp with the preamp. 
But I mean, I played that forever. And, you know, the tone controls on the gain channel were gain, volume, and contour. Contour, ah. Yeah, there was no highs, mids, lows, treble, nothing. Just gain, right. contour, and, and, and volume. And I played right. that forever. And, pe you know, people would look at my rig and laugh and say shit. And it's like, you know, because I'm not playing some high-end tube amp or I'm not playing some preamp, rack preamp and multi-effects processors and all that stuff. It's like, man, I don't need it, you know. And it well, took me forever to graduate away from that. At first, my first step to getting away from that was like that. Okay, well, it's a solid state preamp. I'll try a tube power amp with it. So I started using some tube power amps and yeah. that was pretty cool. And then a friend of mine introduced me to a Bogner Ubershaw. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and that was the first tube head I ever bought. And uh, yeah, and I still, I still have that. But I, I think in many ways, I'm still on my tone quest myself. You know what I mean? Well, I'll be honest, man. Now that I have, I, I guess, you know, I'm getting older too, Rusty, and I'm realizing I don't want to sack half sacks around no more. Yeah. <laughs> Take out 40 pedal boards. Yeah. So the rig I have now, man, I can literally take out my Johnny Highland amp, my Kiesel guitar, and a handful of pedals on an earth board. I'm using earth boards now today because they're magnetized. Cool. So if I want to change out pedals, I can just pull the magnet instead of ripping my guts out with Velcro all the time. Yeah, man, that's great. But, but the funny thing is, man, I'm back to being able to say, you know, I can go out and play a honky tonk gig. I can take two Johnny amps and play an arena if I had to, or a theater or what have you. Or I can take any of this rig in the studio and sound like me, you know. I and think so still have enough ear candy on my board where I can do other genres and other things, you know? Sure. Well, I think I, uh, just for people that are, you know, as they're watching and talking about tone, cause that's something that, you know, especially on this guitar autopsy thing, we'll post, you know, little clips of the show where it's like, okay, Hey, we talk about this subject or we talk about this subject, but the number one video that everybody always clicks on clip wise is about tone. You know, what's this guy's tone? What's this guy's tone? Because they're everybody's still trying to find what they're what they like, you know, and I sure. think that it's a twofold problem with tone, or at least for me and, and the, from what my students talk to me about, you know, because I have people they bring their amps right over here and they're like, I can't get a good tone. And I'll tell you what, like, like what you had said, where you kind of go backwards a little bit. That's when they find their tone. Like you have to stop worrying about what the Internet tells you. You know, stop worrying about what all the pedals that everybody's trying to f push on you and start, like Rusty said, you, you know, you're putting Band-Aids on a wound. Like, that's not, you got to start at the foundation of what it is. Like, and some guys, like, really like Angus Young. Okay, well, then you don't need a tube screamer and all these other pedals, like, you know, the metal pedal, you know, all those bullshit things. I was like, you need a freaking small Marshall tube amp that he used way back in the day, those little, like, whatever the hell they were yeah, called. I can't combos, remember. Like, whatever. Yeah, like just the little guy. And they're like, oh, no, he can't get that massive tone from that. And I'm like, yeah, he can. And he did because he does, you know. And then uh, so that the, the first problem, I think, is that, you know, just overcomplicating something that doesn't need to be complicated. Well, and, you know, Zach, that you, now that you mentioned that, brother, I'll be honest. I, I had a lot of people saying, dang, Johnny, man, your best tone, dude, is when you played a Fender Telly and a Fender Twin. Yep. <laughs> Back the Don Kelly days when you were at Roberts. Yeah. Well, honestly say, you know, I was with Fender. They never released my guitar. And there's a long story behind all that that I won't get into. But I'll say this. It's right now with my Johnny Highland Kiesel that is a T-style with my fat Jimmy amp that is a 112 Celestion G12 K100 with, you know, 85 watt tube amp, you know, and the and the array of pedals, I feel like I am more back to a what you would call a honky tonkin guitar rig per se. That's a lot easier to get around than what I used to carry, but yet I'm actually having more fun because it's a more versatile rig. Yeah, it's, even it's though a, it's smaller. So if that makes any sense, yes, I have grown to actually find my identity better, and I don't consider it a step backwards. I just look at it as. Hey man, mini pedals are the end thing now. Pedal boards are, are shrinking nowadays instead of getting bigger. So it's like, and you know what? Johnny's getting older. With some hand <laughs> issues, and frankly, I don't want to carry big shit around no more. So it's easier with a 112 combo and a and your diesel on your back with a little mini earth board, a 1020 yeah. or something, you know? Yeah. With five pedals on it, because that's really all you need. 
And it's really a pure tone too, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a pure tone and you can virtually do anything. I think, you know, when it comes to studio work, I mean, shit, there's so many plugins and different things you can get. But frankly, man, a good compressor and a delay pedal and a, and you know, Russ, you mentioned a preamp, brother. You know, after 46 years of my life, brother, I just got turned on to preamps last year. Really? What yeah. Was the, what was I, the preamp? Well, to be honest with you, when I moved up here to Virginia, my dear friend, Kenny Thurman, uh, who has been uh, a major, major sound man in Nashville, he, he's been out with everyone from Mike Henderson and the Blue Bloods, Mark Chestnut, Vince Gill, Phil Vassar, you know, Jamie O'Neill, all these country artists all through the years. He even worked for the Grand Ole Opry, but he lives in Danville. And so we have been teamed up doing full band recordings for people because I play 22 instruments and Kenny mixes and masters. And we, so we you do play, full band. Say, say what? I'm sorry? You play how many instruments? 22. You play 22 instruments. You got to be kidding me. No, man. My last album, I played every instrument on it myself. What? Yeah. Shut up. Really? That's Program. amazing, dude. Yeah, That's... I play a lot of stuff. And as a matter of fact, I was actually given a lap steel today. So I've been having so much fun in the studio. You know, do you find... Do you find that after having played, you know, so many different instruments that playing a new instrument is not as hard? No, actually, it was funny because when my dear friend, Mr. Swank Daddy came over here and brought me that that lap steel, man. It was like he wanted to hear me plug it in and just see what I could do with it off the top, but it's tuned to a six chord. So and you're just holding a bar with a thumb pick on and just, you know. But I gotta admit, man, I feel like that giddy little kid all over again. That's like, oh, something new and musical. Let's see what noise I can get out of it. You know, let's see what it does, you know? And so I think the challenge, man, is to find out what music you can pull out of it, even though you don't much you don't know much about the instrument. And so I'm still that giddy little kid, man, that, that loves that opportunity to mess around with something I've never played with before. So you're good enough to play all these instruments on your records. What, do you sleep? Not much. Yeah, I didn't think so. I mean, how could you? That's, that's amazing, dude. Well, and honest to God, Rusty, it's, it's, a, it's a gift from God, man. When a, when a legally blind kid, you know, is born in the state of Maine and people are going, what's going to happen to this kid's life? Mm -hmm. And then by the age of three, man, I'm winning talent shows and bringing home five, six hundred bucks a week. As a by how old? Kid. What age? Three three <laughs> man, I, yeah, dude, I was playing, man when i was when i was actually seven years old i was already playing guitar banjo mandolin and fiddle in my show holy cow dude i yeah i mean i won entertainer of the year for the Downey's country music association and won instrumentalist of the year for guitar banjo mandolin and fiddle and but see i it, but i wasn't addicted to the electric guitar then and so after that electric guitar obsession came into my life, things changed. You know, it was trying to keep my dad happy and doing what he wanted. But deep down inside, I knew one day I wanted to play the Grand Ole Opry and I wanted to be ripping an electric guitar. Yeah. And That's so pretty cool, man. That was what was beating down inside my heart the whole time. You know? So you brought up something interesting that maybe not a lot of people know uh, about being legally blind. And maybe they do know, maybe they don't, but, you know, maybe they're watching you for the first time right now. So you're legally sure. blind, have been since birth, correct? Yes. And um, so my, so that's quite the adversity to have to overcome, right? You know, like just in, in life in general, you weren't, you were kind of dealt kind of not the best hand at birth of not being able to see. So talk about, you know, how did you overcome that and what's the importance of like, how did you use that to your advantage to become a better player? You know what I mean? You know, brother, I, I can only tell you it's, it's a gift from God. And I can, I can only tell you that in truth and total truth, because as a little kid, man, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that, you know, my dad had my grandfather's 1938 G35 Gibson sitting in the corner that was all beat to crap. It had sat in my aunt's attic for years and I would take that, dad would tune it to an open E chord, and I'd be sitting there when he'd come home from work playing along to commercials on television. <laughs> wow. And he's going, what? I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, I remember it, you know, four years old, we were at a family reunion, 
And my dad was, my dad was a drummer in the sixties. So he had this little trap kit he had borrowed to play this little gig. And here I am four years old, barely my legs getting down off the stool, you know, but I'm, I'm sitting there keeping a groove. My dad's like, who taught you this? As a, as a kid, I, and I say it's a gift from God, man, because I never worked on instruments. It was always so fun. It was never practice. And I can say as a 46-year-old man getting that lap steel today, I'm the same way right now, man. I am so giddy and so in love with anything that makes music. It's like I could go to the grocery store as a kid and find one of those whistles that you blow and move yeah. the thing. <laughs> you know, the penny it? whistle, yeah. I'd be playing with that shit. All through the storm, my mom's like, please stop. <laughs> Make music with it. Yeah. So everything musically for me as a kid was all about fun. It wasn't about sitting there practicing a major scale 14 hours a day. Or, But then again, it was like I, I knew that I needed that. But here's an example. My dad took me to a guy named Dave Kenyon in, in Canada for a banjo lesson. Dad bought me a banjo for a hundred bucks. And the guy gave me about a 10 to 15 minute lesson and told my dad, I can't teach this kid because his eyes aren't focusing on me. I don't, I don't know what he's seeing. I don't know. And so he kind of gave up on me. But by that weekend, I was on stage playing Foggy Mountain Breakdown. <laughs> you know, an O.R.L. Scruggs tune. And, and won all these contests playing banjo after a 10 minute banjo lesson. How does that happen? So, it's all in the ears, man. So I can assure you, I didn't, but now granted, when I got my electric guitar, then dad started taking me to Bill Pierce and Bangalore, Maine uh, to take actual formal lessons. And I, I will say, learning the theory of the guitar and, you know, Billy was a GIT grad, man, still lives up in Maine and he's still a beast of a player, man. He's incredible. Yeah, I know, I know that name. Yeah, Billy's awesome, man. And I, but I remember... It was funny, man. It was like going to a classical fusionist to learn how to play Ricky Staggs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was, but like he, like he showed me instantly, he said, Johnny, all music theory is the same, brother. Whether you love Ricky Staggs and I love Ingve Malmsteen, it's still the same theory. And so as he taught me over time, I think what Billy found interesting is that I was spreading my wings, so to speak, because I was loving so many guitar players you know, anywhere from Eric Johnson to Ricky Skaggs to B.B. King and, and Steve Vai, you know, and just loving every ounce of guitar music I could get my hands on. Yeah. You know, I loved Jeff Healy. I loved, uh, you know, Jeff Healy, related, I related to him because of the blindness thing and went and saw Jeff three times live. He was incredible, man. I just yeah. loved him. So, but then again, I also saw a guy who could play blues and mix it with rock and do it well. Yeah, I was a big Jeff Healy fan when he came out. Me too, man. Not his vibrato, man. His vibrato was insane. Oh, it was incredible, man. But I, but I guess what I'm saying is, I think it's it's amazing that I was able to, uh, you know, just get into so many different styles and love them all. And so, yes, it was weird for me to be practicing pentatonics like a bastard to be a chicken picker, <laughs> but yet going, oh, well, what was that Ingve lick you just did? What's that? Yeah whole neoclassical thing you know what yeah, was that all about for sure man and so you're right a lot of ear training but yet my interest level was just peaked all the time so i couldn't be that kid to read tablature out of a guitar player magazine or watch a hot Licks video and be able to grab stuff but what i was able to do was watch austin city limits and grab inspiration yes watch hee-haw and grab inspiration watch whatever i could see on tv you know that's and, in, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so I mean that's really the the overlying thing for me is is it wasn't work for me as a kid. It was practice was not practice, it was fun. Now, on the other hand, as Zach was saying, living with this visual impairment, yeah, I wasn't a popular kid in school. So my guitar was literally my best friend. Oh, yeah. I had a lot of great friends in school, don't get me wrong, and everyone you know, as I became known in the town and being in the paper all the time for winning awards and going to different places, performing on the weekends. Well, then I wasn't just Mr. Four Eyes and Teacher's Pet and stuff like that. I, I became the, you know, the guy that people are watching in town. So, 
so the guitar really helped me in every avenue, even when it came to school and stuff like that. So, but the guitar did become my best friend. It really was the main thing that I lived with all the time. So what advice would you just give in general if somebody has an adversity? What would you say to those people if they well, wanted to be a musician? Never give up on yourself. If you have a dream to play music and you find out that you do have a God-given talent where you can grab an instrument and have so much fun with it, like I did, where it wasn't work to practice, it was fun to practice. And you wanted it so badly that you would be willing to do whatever, however many hours it took to become good at the instrument. Uh, you know, don't give up on yourself. Guitar is not always easy. It's not always fun. If it was, we'd have 14 million rock stars out there. Exactly. But the fact is, it's a hard instrument to, to, to master. Yes. And I don't think, I think Rusty and you, Zach, and myself all would say, we're not masters at the guitar. No. We're still learning. Yes. And I've stolen from everybody. I'm a thief. I'm a guitar <laughs> <thief>. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, man. Brent Mason, Danny Gatton, you name it. Yeah. Stolen from every guitar player. Even when Zach got a lesson with me, I stole stuff from him. He just don't know yeah. it. Oh, great. <laughs> That's awesome, man. But anyway, I guess what I'm saying is, if you have the inspiration and the desire, don't give up on yourself. Stick with it, because that guitar will be your best friend if you want it to be. And you know what? It's okay to have days where you feel frustrated and you put it down and you walk away, but you go right back to it the next morning. Pick it right back up and keep going. Because it will be with you always. The guitar is not going to get pissed at you and walk away. It can't I, say that, I say that to my students. I say, you know, girlfriends come and go, but guitar lasts forever, dude. Yeah. When they, always, start, when they start getting up at 14, 15 years, they want to have a girlfriend. I'm like, dude, it's not going to last very long, and you better get, keep well, getting good at the guitar. Brother, I've been married for almost 17 years now. That's awesome, man. And I got to be honest, brother, I always tell people I had to marry Miss Kimmy because all my guitars are my girlfriends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And especially my Kiesels, man. I, I make love to those. I can't help it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, you know, it's like I can relate to so many things you said. Um, you know, for me, I was a popular kid in school until I started playing guitar. Ah. Because once I started playing guitar, I never left the house. Right. You know what I mean, I went from hanging out all the time to friends and stuff like that. You lose a lot of friends quick when you answer the phone like this. What? I'm trying to practice. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. wasn't smart enough to turn the ringer off. But, you know, I, uh, you know, when I said practicing was never practice for me. I mean, I practiced hardcore and was disciplined about it and had schedules and all that stuff. But it was always fun. I never didn't enjoy it. I mean, I, you can't force yourself to do something you don't enjoy. You know what I mean? Well, and that's why I say it's almost like it becomes an addiction because... Sure. Because really, man, if you start running scales and you, like you said, you keep your discipline. And I think in order to get good at anything in life, you have to be disciplined. You have to keep your motivation peaked at all times. And it's, it's really, for me, it was, like you said, you didn't, practice wasn't hard, no. but yet you stayed disciplined at it. And, and I think really that's the one thing, even if you're handicapped or someone's watching this that is handicapped, you'll find a way around your handicap to get good at something you love. And I think that's why I'm 46 years old sitting here with Rusty and with Zach saying, hey, look, folks, I'm still learning every day of my life. Yeah. And I still am like that giddy little kid that anytime a new record comes out from one of my favorite guitarists, I buy it. And I see yeah. how many licks I can steal off. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. man. So, I, I mean, I, but I think that that fervor stays within us, that vigor to want more, to, to yearn to get better all the time. I think that's instilled. So I just say this, if you do, if you're a handicapped person watching this and you love guitar, don't ever stop loving it. Don't allow your discipline and your, your motivation uh, to stay disciplined allow you to lose your fun in guitar because some people can take it to the extreme but you always say as long as you keep the fun factor in it you're going to succeed and you're just going to keep going and getting better and better through the whole thing handicap or not yeah amen to that brother amen to that 
Well, guys, man, I think we've been taking up enough. Uh, Johnny, I think we've taken enough of your, of your time up today. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's, it's oh, brother, it's absolutely my pleasure, man. And, and I appreciate you and Zach so much. And I'm a huge fan of both of you. Likewise. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, it's funny, man. When I sit around guys, of, of, you know, like yourselves, uh, you know, I'm in such awe of what you guys both play on the guitar. It's amazing. I will thank you. And well, I right back at you because I don't understand what you do most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I feel the same way about you, brother. I really do. You guys are beasts, truly. Yeah, man. Amen, brother. Thank you. That's so much. what that's what makes the world go round, man. It's all the it's it's to have that ability to like things outside of what your main thing is. You know, yeah. I, mean? I encounter that all the time. Growing up, and even still as an adult, I find it strange when I. You know, that I can sit around with other people and listen to the stuff that they love, but as soon as I start putting on stuff that I dig, that's yeah. out of their comfort zone, they, they can't listen. Oh, no, I don't like that. Oh, I don't listen to that. And it's like, well, I just sat here and listened to 20, 30 minutes of what you wanted to let me hear. Now, maybe you can't get through, like, you know, a song of stuff that I like. Right. It's, it's so weird to me to see have people be that closed-minded. And I've seen musicians like that, and it blows my mind that a musician, musicians can be like that. It's like, you know... Dude, I mean, how do you? Well, you know, Rusty, that brings up a good topic, brother. I'm a big, huge Danny Gatton fan. He's been my main influence through the years. And what I loved about him was he had such an aggressive style. And I really do feel like, man, if Danny Gatton had to become a shredder, we would all would have been in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> and I think better meaning of a heavy metal rock dude, you yeah. know. Yeah. Not saying Danny Gatton probably never cranked on dirt and tried it, you know. Yeah. Sure. And it's like myself. I've certainly had my day of rocking out and having fun. And I started having hand troubles a couple of years ago, and I wear a thumb pick now. Okay. Pretty hard to do arpeggio sweeps with a thumb pick. I'll just say yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I guess, you know, all right, so my question to both of you guys, and I think it would be fun for all the people out there watching, what, is the, what are the last two records you just listened to? Oh, let me see. Well, you know what? I don't think the I, I, I don't I don't know because the last thing I've listened to was a playlist. Okay. But but I'll tell you I'll give you the gist of what was on the playlist. There it's you a go. Playlist called Shred, and it's a compilation of every unaccompanied guitar solo that I'm aware of, all compiled together in a uh, in a in a playlist, and then it goes from unaccompanied guitar solos into uh, all instrumentals. Oh, wow. So it's got everything from all the shrapnel guys to Holdsworth to Demiola, the fusion guys. I mean, everything of every genre, country guys, um, you know, it's got some Brent Mason on there. I got to add some of your stuff down there, man. Um, Not you know, so it's it's a compilation of, a, of just all great guitar players from unaccompanied solos to instrumental work. Well, you know, Rusty, it's funny, but we, we uh, not too long ago, Andy James came on the Kiesel family. Mm hmm. And man, what a beast. Yeah, he's a killer guitar I, you know, player. We got, in the Kiesel family, we got Andy James, we got McGrawlin, you know, Jason Becker is still with Kiesel, of course. God love Jason, man. Oh, man, absolutely. And uh, Big influence of mine. Alan Holsworth, obviously. So when I look, Frank and Bali, so yeah. when I look at the Kiesel family, man, I, I kind of laugh because I'm like really the only country boy that's really just traditional chicken picking a lot, you know? Uh, even though I mix it with other genres, I'm still kind of that, that country boy, you know? Well, I mean, so that's, that's what makes, um, you know, I mean, you're in great company, dude. Oh my goodness. Because man. I mean, it's got legendary rock guys, yourself, legendary country player, legendary, one of the best, if not the greatest jazz fusion player ever, Alan Holt. Oh, unbelievable. You know? man. And Gambali's up there too, man. And not, not to take anything away from Frank, uh, cause yeah. he's a beast in his own right. I mean, Frank was a big influence on my playing as well as Alan, um, so, man, that's a great company to be in. Oh, man, it truly is, brother. And, Zach, what about you, brother? What you been listening to? Well, I just had to, I had to jump onto my Spotify because everything's on there of what uh -huh. I'm listening to. So I give you an accurate uh, thing. Because usually I listen to podcasts, you know, because I don't – when I leave here, I listen to stuff like this, you know, where I can listen to people I want to hear talk. But from sure. an album standpoint, uh, it looks like the last album I was listening to was uh, Zero Order Phase from Jeff Loomis. And then Ooh. the next, and then the next one after that was the Eagles' greatest hits. Oh, nice! Because Eagles are my favorite, uh, like 
country rock band, uh, which is great, you know, because they got all the cool chicken pick and stuff too back when, uh, uh, God, what was that guitar player's name? Uh, their, their original guy who did the banjo. I don't know, man. Oh my God. What was his name? Why can't I think of it right now? No. Now anyway, that I, yeah. Now that I think about it, I've been listening to CDs in my car and the last two CDs that I listened to in my car were, um, Scott Stein's CD broke and, um, Oh, I did uh, listen to that too. Yeah. And, uh, what was the other one? Uh, and I was listening to Greg Howe's band what, that he used to have with his brother called How To. Yes. Oh, <laughs> sweet. Yeah. Good oh, stuff, boy. man. Greg Howe's playing on those. I mean, Greg Howe's an amazing player, period. But those two rock albums he did with his brother on vocals were really killer, man. For sure. Well, you guys are, you guys are really going to laugh when you hear what I've listened to. Yeah, what is it? I, uh... <laughs> okay, so... Yesterday I was listening to Jimmy Bruno speeding. Okay. Nice. Uh, the the day before I was listening to uh, Farron Young's greatest hits, and today, believe it or not, I was listening to Rush this morning. Nice. Sick. And I actually found my old Helmet record. Wow. Oh dang! Holy cow! Da -da 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 I mean, it's just so heavy. Yeah, Dang. man. For sure, dude. I was listening to Ario Speedwagon while I was in my spa treatment, because because the <laughs> Ario Speedwagon rules, dude. Was it right out the storm? They're right, made... right in the storm. No, it was it was on Spotify. It was just their first like ten songs that popped up. So you got like "Can't Fight This Feeling," "Keep On Loving You," the good stuff, you know. You guys, you guys will laugh too. You know what else I've been really into like within the last month or so is uh, the old Rage Against the Machine albums. Oh yeah. And I love Morello, man. What a what a beast. And and also uh, uh, the the new well, they've been around a while, but Rival Sons. Okay, yeah, oh, man. Oh yeah, I dig those guys. A great band. I've been yeah. really digging them a lot. For sure. And a lot of people still don't know about those guys. I'm surprised they haven't had more commercial success. I mean, they're absolutely mind blowing. I was watching a download festival on Axis a couple of years back, and you know, huge bands, Megadeth, Metallica, blah, 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 this, that, and the other. And then all of a sudden, Rival Sons comes out. And I'm just like, holy shit, who are these guys? Yeah. And I instantly went out and, oh, of course, you know, everything's on your phone nowadays. So I ordered the, because I love, I still love CDs. I'm still old school. Man, me too, bro. So I went on Amazon and ordered their actual CDs, that, you know, the CDs I could get from them. And I've just been a huge fan ever since. And, uh, but it's fun because, here I am, a chicken picker, but yet I've been listening to a lot of rock albums lately. Right. And and like Rusty said, he's got you know chicken pickers on his on his uh, yeah on your on your spin, you know what you listen to. And speaking of that, man, I want to ask you real quick: What do you think about Scotty Anderson? Oh, dude, Mister Triple Stop. Yes, he I have that. I have that on vinyl, dude. Oh, Triple Stop. Tri yep, I have that yeah. on. I have that record on vinyl. And I actually had him sign it. I went to the oh. National Guitar Summer Workshop in Connecticut in like 85 when I was a kid. And I went Man, specifically that week to see him. He is literally the country beast. Yeah. He and Brent Mason are both the country beasts. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. Scotty's the same way, man. I mean, I wish he had have moved to Nashville and really done the whole hoopla. Yeah. But God love him for not doing that. Yeah. He's you sick. Know? I, mean, I, I mean, he's like... Amazing. He, you know, I was with a buddy of mine. We were playing up in Ohio, and someone had said, Johnny Scotty's playing four doors down, dude. But we were playing at the same time, so I couldn't yeah. break away to go watch him. Yeah. And it just killed me, man, that I had to leave that town that night knowing Scotty was playing and I couldn't go see him. Yeah, man. I saw him play at, uh, at the guitar workshop, and he played with the faculty, and, and he played for a couple hours, and it was just uh. like, nonstop. And I was like sitting right there, and I had a little recorder. And recorded his uh recorded the set real quick and or not real quick as much as my tape would hold and yeah he's an amazing he's one of the best guitar players i've ever seen really and i always forget to talk about him um and his stuff i mean his stuff is so hard dude to try to yeah make. well and you know the one last thing i'll mention too rusty especially with you and zach both being teachers too man there are opportunities in our lives where we meet people that touch us in some ways 
and then something tragic happens. We, we had a boy up here named Jacob Doss up, in, up here in Virginia who was really, really taken off in the blues world, man. The kid was a great singer, but he was, he was coming for me for, you know, to me for lessons and stuff, but he was a great player in his own right. 19 years old, man, had played, uh, had done a flooring job during the week after he graduated high school and was playing on the weekends and actually fell asleep at the wheel, man, and, and uh, was killed. That's one of the hardest funerals I think I've been to, man. I, you know, so I, I think what's so incredible, man, is even through teaching all the people that we're able to meet, uh, and I didn't even know Zach until he reached out and said, can I get a lesson with you, man? And now here I am on camera with both of you guys, man. So yeah, it's, but it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Sure. Um, yeah, Zach, actually, that's how I met Zach. He actually came to me for lessons. No and, kid. And then we, and then we started talking and then, you know, he was helping me out with some of my social media stuff. And then, you know, we started talking about doing this and, and here we are. Well, he happens to be quite the fella, man. I'll tell you, I, I, uh, I'm certain we're talking shit about you, bro. Ah, damn. Yeah. We're in here toting you up, buddy. Like new money. Yeah. yeah cool. <laughs> Well, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's always great to see uh, up and coming players and doing well. And he was, you know, Johnny was just telling me about a, a, a tragic story. What was the guy's name again? His name was Jacob Doss, man. He was 19 years old, lived up here in Virginia. And uh, that kid was going to take off and do wonderful things, man. I, I was really blessed to get to work with that kid on an EP and then of course teach him guitar as well and become a friend to him over the years. But you know, I think I first met him when he was like 12 or something. And, and, uh, but as my wife and I moved up here to Chatham, Virginia, you know, he was playing live gigs around. Here. And, uh, good gracious, man, the kid was just taken off. He was incredible. Did he ever get to the point where he was recording anything? Yeah. I, like I said, I had done a five song EP with him. Okay. And, and then what course, happened? Yeah. There's some like live, uh, footage that they still have. Uh, but he, I think, I don't think he ever really did a full length album though. No. Gotcha. What Johnny, happened? Johnny said he fell asleep at the wheel driving home from a gig or something. What was yeah, it? Yeah, he had worked, he had worked a flooring job during the week, man. And then played like three gigs on the weekend, went to his bass player's birthday party and fell asleep on the way home, man. Oh no. I had a car wreck, man. And it took him, man. So I, I just, but I told Rusty, it's amazing who we meet as guitar teachers. Yeah. As much being the players we are, you know, it's amazing that, you, you know, you get so intertwined in people's lives for being a guitar teacher or, and, you know, really caring about folks that you teach, you yeah, know, I, I, I can tell you this, that as a guitar teacher, and I've been teaching since 1987, I started when I was a senior in high school, um, or actually that'd been 1986. Uh, but, uh, so that's a long time, <laughs> probably longer than most of the viewers have been alive. Uh, or me. <laughs> yeah. Or you son and uh <laughs> <laughs> it's it, i i have to say that this job because of this job as a guitar teacher if you want to call it a job because it's playing guitar and that's not really working but uh uh i've met some, some of the greatest people ever because of this job you know what i mean yeah. Yeah, people i would have never in any, any other situation have ever been blessed with coming in contact with you know what i mean so it's it's you been know Russ, I, I remember brother hanging out with mark tremani when they were you know, mm -hmm. back in my PRS days. And yeah, he was actually saying, man, I, I'm going to go start taking some lessons from this guy named Rusty. And I went, Rusty Cooley? He's like, yeah, man. He's like, I said, oh, dude, you're in for it, man. Because he got a lesson or two from me, you know, just yeah. hanging out, buds, you know. And then he said he was going to go to you. And I'm like, I won't ever see you again, brother. You'll be yeah. you'll be with <laughs> Yeah, man. Me and Mark have been friends for a long time. And uh, he's, he's one of those great people that I've had the pleasure of meeting. And if it wasn't for teaching and you know, being a guitarist and, you know, I mean, that would never happen, you know? So actually, brother, we kind of got sidetracked on the preamp thing too. I, are oh, yeah. you still using a preamp? Um, pedal? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I, I have a Kemper, which is the preamp and power amp that yeah. I use and I'm not using it exclusively. I kind of use it, exclu you know, when I'm teaching and stuff, cause it's easy, you know, and I, you know, it's not like a tube amp. I'm not burning tubes all day long. Um, yeah. and then I have, uh, I do have three tube heads. I've got uh, behind me. I don't know if you can see them or not, but I've got a PV6505 Plus. I've got a Bogner Ubershaw, and I've got a Rev Generator P100P 
Oh that's yeah. I use more like, yeah, when I'm playing out live, I use that, but I've, I got the Kemper kind of during COVID and for me, everything has got to pass the rehearsal room test before it really makes the stage. Yeah. I, I did play one gig with it, but it was, it was kind of a short gig. So I just did it anyway without really giving it the full on rehearsal room test. So I'm still not sure how I feel about it. 110%, you know, I kind of think it's hard when we were talking about getting your own identity and, and your own sound. I, for me, I, and this is my own personal belief. Uh, you guys might agree or disagree with it, but I think it's hard to have a real pure, unique, identifiable sound when you're playing on anything but a two head. Yeah. Because you know, if you're playing on digital stuff or process stuff or amp modeling or, or, you know, even if it's amp modeling or if it's profiling, it's still not a real amp to me. That's right. You know what I mean? For me, it has to be, you know, people get their real sounds by playing on real tube amps with their own unique blend of pedals or whatever in their guitar. And, you yep. know, I um, think that's where the real sounds come from, the greatest sounds, at least throughout, as we know it in history so far. Um, you know what I mean? But, well, uh, you know, honestly, Rusty, I think one thing, brother, that happened to me kind of by accident is... And I, of course, I just told you, I mean, I haven't really been hip to preamp pedals and stuff of that nature since, you know, a couple of years ago. But when I moved up here, my buddy Kenny Thurman and I, we've teamed up doing full band tracking for people. But Kenny plays guitar, too. And he he was running this little solid state Fender Champ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but on his pedal board, he had one of the old ART Studio V2 tube preamps. OK, yeah. And I was like well, man, what the, you know, what is up with this, man? And he's like, dude, that's really what's giving me the true old Fender tone. Yeah. It's having that tube preamp through the solid state amp. It's giving me the tube-like sound, the tube sound. And I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, man. I'm running a, you know, 185 to 100 watt tube head. I wonder what it would be for me to try a solid state preamp pedal on my board because as you know a touring musician i don't want to put a tube pedal on my board yeah while you're on the road and stuff man that's yeah. kind of dangerous you know? yeah for sure and so anyway i happened to meet nick greer at the nam show one day and i because my dilemma has always been you know having a super you know ultra clean high headroom chicken picking tone was danny gatton being my hero it's like how do you get that danny gatton tone through a hundred watt tube amp because Danny used to play through like a Vibrolux or whatever and crank it to 10 and it would just yeah. sound great. Yeah. And so I called Nick Greer one day and I told him the whole story of meeting, you know, of rehooking up with Kenny and how he was using a tube preamp through a solid state amp. And of course now he's playing a boss katana. So yeah. he's still using the tube pre. And I said, Nick, do you have any pedals, man, that would preamp pedals? Cause I said, I noticed on YouTube, you make a plethora of them. You've got, a, you know, quite a few of them. I said, do you make something that could give us 100-watt tube amp players that Danny Gatton sound without blowing everybody's eardrums out? And he said, dude, he said, I'll tell you what, man. Uh, I, he had just created a pedal called the Soma. Soma 63. And that has been a main, one of the main pedals for me nowadays, man. I just don't want to, I don't even like to play without that amp anymore, or that pedal anymore. It's just such an amazing, uh, I can literally take a watt tube amp, totally clean tone, Johnny Highland tone, whatever, my signature tone, and then go into a Danny Gatton tune, hit that preamp pedal, and it sounds like I'm playing a cranked Vibrolux. So it's incredible, man. So what I was going to tell you is on the rock side of things and from the studio standpoint, I have found that I can take that Soma and... I always put like, so it's, it's kind of compressor, Soma, and then my dirt pedals from light to heavy on my pedal board. But what I found is I can, if you got a nice dirty tone through your amp or with your pedals, whatever you're running, add the Soma to it and you can get that extra oomph, that extra gain. By not turning the pedal all the way up, you're just adding just that little tiny nuance of preamp pedal. So, I found that it made my tube screamer sound better. My, you know, my Johnny Highland grumble box with metal pedals. It just gives me just that little, it just takes my phone from here to raw. It just makes it bigger. That's cool. Who makes this? 
Uh, it's the uh, Greer Amp Soma 63. Okay. I'll and it is bad it bone digging. I have That's had awesome. so much for that pedal. Well, killer. That sounds like a good note to wrap it up on, man. Um, good, yeah. good high note. The Highland note. There you the go. Highland note. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right, brother. Man, you have a great day, Johnny. It's been nothing but a pleasure, bro. Appreciate you, man. Man, I appreciate you guys. The pleasure is all mine, and thanks again for having me.